Hello, everyone. Welcome to the APS seminar for this week. I am introducing Navjot Singh. Uh, he previously did his undergraduate degree at Punjab Agricultural University in India. He majored in weed science and has previously worked on integrated weed management in corn wheat, in corn wheat crop rotation. A fun fact about Navjot is that he frequently gets locked out of his apartment. <laughs> Um, and he's currently advised by Debelin uh, Saram. His seminar is titled Management of Herbicide Resistant Water Hemp in Soybean. And with that, I will give it up to Navjat to start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Navjot, and I am a first year master's student with Dr. Debelin Sarangi as my major advisor. So today, I'm going to talk about the management of herbicide resistant water hemp in soybean. So I'll begin with the introduction, then I'll move to my research objectives, and then I'll talk about hypothesis and the methodology I'm adopting. And then we'll move to some of the preliminary results that I'm having. And in the end, we'll wrap up with the future directions. So okay. moving. One second, everybody.
So moving forward to crop weed competition, any idea what's the crop here? No worries, if you are not able to guess, I am here to help. It's actually a soybean field and it was totally taken over by water hemp and it's not that we have not sprayed anything. It's actually a pre-emergence herbicide efficacy trial that was sprayed with different pre-emergence herbicide. But this year, due to drought, it didn't work well. So seeing how severe could be the weeds. So let's move to how much could be the yield losses due to weeds. If left uncontrolled, weeds could cause 50% 50, 50 yield losses in corn and 52% in soybean. And the potential yield losses could be higher for sugar beet and could reach up to 70% because of poor competitive ability. And up along the second column corresponding to the put. So corresponding to the potential yield loss, there could be a potential economic loss of 26, 16, and 1.7 billion USD for corn, soybean, and sugar beet respectively. And talking about Minnesota in particular, if left unchecked, weeds could reduce soybean yield by 65%. So now moving to what's the most troublesome weeds in Minnesota. So University of Minnesota Extension, they conducted a survey where they asked the farmers to provide the name of the most troublesome weeds they face difficulty in managing. So out of 166 respondents, 49 of them referred to the water hemp as the most problematic and 45 of them referred to the giant ragweed and similarly, 27 of them refer to common lamb squatters and so on, as we can see. So moving to the most problematic weed, water hemp. Water hemp, Amaranthus tuberculatus, is a summer annual weed. It's native to the North America. It's diploid with the diploid chromosome number equal to 32. It's actually a seed propagator and its seed size is quite small and could range from 0.8 to 1 millimeter in diameter. We can see at the base, here we have a picture that compares water hemp seed size with that of corn and soybean. And to the right side, we have a picture of mature female water hemp plant. So water hemp is a dioecious species. It has a male and female inflorescence on a separate plants, which means it's an obligate outcrosser, water hemp, at the base, we have a picture that compares male and female water hemp and fluorescence. Water hemp has a high genetic diversity. If we take a look at the picture in our right corner, we can see there are three water hemp plants in a frame. The middle one has a characteristic lookup of water hemp and two to the sides, they have a red stem morphology and one to the extreme right, it even has a reddish in fluorescence. So water hemp pollen could move over a long distance. A study reported that water hemp pollen could move up to 800 meter. And the same study reported that water hemp pollen could be viable for five days. So moving to the how competitive water hemp could be in soybean. So a study from Ontario reported that water hemp could reduce soybean yield by 73% if it's allowed 
to interfere with soybean at the density of 126 plants per meter square. And similarly, the, another study reported that water hemp could cause 56% soybean yield reduction if its density is eight plants per meter of linear meter of row length. So now discussing why is water hemp so problematic? Water hemp is a prolific seed producer. It can produce in excess of 300,000 seeds per plant. And in fact, there are some studies that reported even more than a million seeds per female plant. So we can see how quickly it can infest the fields and it, how quickly it can replenish its population after any management tactics. Water hemp has a rapid growth rate. It can grow from an inch to inch and quarter a day. Here at the base, we have a graph by University of Minnesota Extension. On the x-axis, we have a timeline. And along the y-axis, we have a height. You can see in a yellow background that once water hemp is four inches in height, it really grows very quick and reaches up to 22 inches in less than a month. Thus, in this process, it displays a growth rate of more than 0.75 inches a day. For the most of weeds, it's recommended to spray them when they are less than four inches in a height. If we think this in term, if we think about water hemp in this terms, once it has passed the suitable stage, it's really difficult to manage. Water hemp has a prolonged germination. Water hemp in Minnesota, it starts to emerge in May and continues up to late August here at the base. We have a graph that has a percent cumulative emergence along its x-axis and growing degree days along its y-axis. We can see water hemp reaches 10% cumulative emergence once it's slightly over 200 growing degree days and it requires more than 900 growing degree days to complete 90% emergence. Thus, it has a very wide emergence period compared to other weed species like giant foxtail or velvet leaf. And another thing is that water hemp is a cross pollinator, which combined with the long range of pollen transport and high genetic variability, it's, it can evolve really quick. And the last thing is herbicide resistance. Water hemp populations, they are reported resistant to multiple herbicides. So before, Moving to herbicide resistant water hemp, I like to explain what it means by herbicide site of action. So, herbicide site of action represents the specific pathway or a process in which herbicide interferes to interrupt the normal plant growth. So, the number of herbicides with a similar site of action, they are classified together. And in the picture below, we can see the herbicide site of action here is a ALS inhibitor. It interferes in acetolactate synthase pathway and it has a number of herbicides that are under its classification. And the number here represents the reference for ease in classification. So Weed Science Society of America, they have a numbering system to refer to a particular site of action. So now moving to herbicide resistant water hemp. Water hemp has an ability to develop resistance to new herbicide sites of action. And in addition, it can accumulate the resistance to multiple sites of action over a time. So taking a look at this graph along the x-axis, so first we shall take a look at the x-axis alone. Here on the x-axis, we have a year in which resistance to particular herbicide, herbicide site of action was discovered and the points here represents different herbicide sites of action. We can see ALS inhibitor resistant water hemp. It was discovered in 1993 and immediately in the next year, they discovered photosystem two inhibitor resistant water hemp and to the latest report in 2016, where they discovered very long chain fatty acid inhibitor resistant water hemp abbreviated as a VLCFA. And now taking a look at this graph as a whole, along the x-axis, we have a year 
and along the y axis we have a number of sites of action and the line here represents the discovery of the discovery of multiple herbicide resistant water hemp populations as we can see in 1993 it was only water hemp population that were resistant to one site of action and then in 1996 they discovered a water hemp population that was resistant to two different sites of action until the latest report in 2018 where they discovered a water hemp population that was that's resistant to six different sites of action from missouri so eventually we are on to a resistance treadmill we are placing one herbicide by another and to worsen the scenario is that fact that no new herbicide site of action has been discovered since last three, dec three decades so as a potential solution the industries they are coming with the herbicide resistant crop traits so this table shows the year of approval of various herbicide resistant soybean traits along with the herbicides to which they are engineered for resistance for example it starts with the introduction of roundup ready soybeans in 1996 which are resistant to glyphosate and we can see initially there were the traits that were resistant to only one herbicide then industries they shifted to development of herbicide resistant traits that were resistant to two different herbicides and till recently the herbicide resistant traits that are different to three different herbicides are available so now the question is that is this thing a solution maybe no then we need to think what's the key to success we believe that the integrated management is a key to success here we have a big hammer the herbicides and the many little hammers that we can use at a different times in relation to a crop and what we really need to do we need to focus on a weed seed bank that's the pool of viable seeds in pool of viable weed seeds in the soil and we have a techniques that we can use at a pre plant timing at plant mid season pre harvest at harvest or at a post harvest timings and if we combine these different tools together they may have a bigger impact than our large stool herbicides so for example at harvest we have a techniques like mowing and tillage if for weeds they have not produced the seed at that time of crop harvest and similarly if the weeds they have already produced the seed we can go for a harvest weed seed control that i am going to discuss on a next so what what is harvest weed seed control so it refers to the series of techniques that aim to minimize the weed seed deposit into the soil at the time of crop harvest so on the right side we have a picture of a one of the harvest weed seed control tool called seed terminator and there is a research that shows that this harvest weed seed control techniques could be highly effective for water hemp a study from multiple states in united states it reported that water hemp retains 95 to 100% seed till soybean maturity which means that the most of water hemp seed passes through the combines and we can target it through some combine modifications so moving to harvest weed seed control techniques there are numerous harvest weed seed control techniques and among those techniques involving impact mill they are highly effective so what impact mill does they just pulverize the crop chaff so in this process they injures the weed seed which makes them non viable and among the impact mill tool some of impact mill techniques some of the tools like seed terminator and harrington seed destructor they are highly effective and at the base we have a picture of one such tool we can see how it makes crop chaff fine and in this process it injures the weed seed in the picture to the right it displays a cage mill and there is a shaft that rotates in center 
So it makes crop cap fine. And there is a study that's still undergoing at University of Missouri. It shows that the one of such tool called seed terminator, it can destroy up to 98% of water hemp seed. So to sum up and discuss in a brief about the rationale of my objectives, water hemp management is quite challenging, but we have a multiple tools that are available. We need to focus on integrating them. And my research aims to improve water hemp control by integrating the different management tactics. So the first objective for my research is to evaluate the distribution of multiple herbicide resistant water hemp in Minnesota. And objective two is to evaluate the post herbicide application timing and sequence for water hemp control and soybean yield. And objective three, the last one is to evaluate the multi tactic management options for water hemp control in soybean sugar beet rotation. So moving to objective one, here our aim is to evaluate the distribution of multiple herbicide resistant water hemp populations in Minnesota. So moving to the rationale and hypothesis for this study. So beginning with the rationale is that if we have a knowledge about the herbicide distribution of herbicide resistant populations, it could help to decide the best management actions and if we know about the frequency of populations that are resistant to particular herbicide, it could provide insight about the utility of that particular herbicide. And it could also aid to check the spread of resistant individuals in the state. And our hypothesis, hypothesis here is that the multiple herbicide resistant water hemp populations, they are already present in Minnesota. So now, is the seed collection for this study. So all of the samples for this study, they are from the row crop production areas and they were collected in, in 2020 and 2021. Some of the samples, they are farmers and extension educator submissions and the rest of them we collected on our own as a part of row crop production area surveys. And map to the right displays the distribution of our samples, the red ones, the red dots represents the location of samples from 2020, and the blue ones are the samples from 2021. So moving to the methodology that we are using, so we are conducting a whole plant assays in the greenhouse. Our design is a randomized complete block design with seven replications and two experimental runs. Replication here represents the individual plant that was sprayed with the herbicide. So in total, we are screening for eight herbicides at one times and the three times the label dose. So by including eight herbicides at two different doses and adding a non-treated control, we have in total 17 treatments and we are screening 140 populations. So this table depicts the herbicides, the treatments we are using. So we are using the herbicides that are commonly used in corn and soybean from different sites of action. And the, here the first column represents our herbicide active ingredient. And the second column represents the corresponding site of action as defined by the numbering system. And the third one represents the label dose it is the dose that's recommended to be sprayed on either a corn or soybean. So once we have sprayed, what do we evaluate on those plants? So we are recording visually observed percent injury on those plants. So where 0% corresponds to no injury compared to non-treated control and 100%, it represents a complete plant death. At the base, we have a picture that shows how we evaluate the replications. We can see the plant or the replication at the extreme right. It has a completely dead plant. So it will get an injury rating of 100%. And there is a gradient to our left to the leftmost plant that, that will get 0% injury because it's a non-treated control. 
And in addition to this, we are also recording percent survival and percent biomass reduction in comparison to non treated control. So once we have a information, how do we classify whether a population is resistant or it's susceptible to a particular herbicide? We do it based on the three times labeled dose in the picture. At the bottom, we can see if for a particular population at the three times labeled dose of a particular herbicide, less than 40% of individuals survive that population will be classified as a resist as a susceptible. And similarly, if 40 or more than 40% individuals survive, that population will be classified as a resistant to that particular herbicide. And similarly, we decide or we classify the population as a multiple resistant based on the number of sites of action to which it is classified as a resistant. And now moving to some of the preliminary results from our 2020 samples. This, this graph displays the percent populations that were resistant. So on the x-axis, we have a scale that represents the percent populations that were resistant or susceptible. And along the y-axis, we have a treatment list represented by the herbicide active ingredient. We can see for the herbicide amizamox, 100% populations were classified as a resistant. And similarly, for a glyphosate, 66% populations were resistant. 14% populations, they were resistant for atrazine. And similarly, 14% were resistant to pomsefen. And the single population was classified as a resistant to mesotrion. And we didn't observe any population that was resistant, resistant to Glyphosinate, 2-codicoline, or dicamba. So now moving to the multiple herbicide resistant populations from our 2020 samples. Here along the first column, we have a multiple herbicide resistance. And the categories in this column represents the number of sites of action to which a single population was classified as a resistant. For example, the category one-way resistance it includes the populations that were only resistant to one site of action. And similarly, the second category, two-way resistant, includes the population that was resistant to two sites of action. And along the second column, we have a number of populations in respective categories in column one. So we can see out of 21, eight of the populations were one-way resistant and another set of eight populations, they were two-way resistant. And three of the populations in total, they were a three-way resistant. And two of the populations, they were four-way resistant. So this graph depicts the distribution of our multiple herbicide resistant populations. The green dots here represents the location of one-way resistant population. And the purple one represents the location of two-way resistant. And the black one, represents the three-way resistant populations. And finally, the red one, they represents the populations that were four-way resistant. So as to sum up our preliminary results from 2020 samples, all of the populations, they were resistant to amizamox, 66% populations, they were resistant to glyphosate. And the concerning thing is that the number of three-way and four-way resistant populations, they are on rise. So moving to objective two, here our aim is to evaluate the post herbicide application timing and sequence for hemp control and soybean yield. So here I would like to explain the three terms, what it means by pre-herbicide, what it means by post, and what are the residual herbicides. So the pre-herbicide, it refers to the herbicides that are applied immediately after crop planting, but before the emergence, and the post herbicides, they represent the herbicides that are applied in season to control already emerged weeds. And the residual herbicides, they are the herbicides that are applied in season to check the new emergence. So as I've discussed before, discussed before, there are the herbicide resistant traits available that are resistant to three different herbicides and list E3 is among them. It's engineered for resistance to, glyph resistance to glyphosate, 
to fosinate and to codicoline. And in addition, we have a choice to apply the herbicides that we can apply to non-engineered soybean. So which, so now with this availability of choice, there arises a question, what we should apply, when we should apply, and what should be the sequence of our application. So the study will help the farmers to plan for their herbicide programs in endless soybean. So our hypothesis here is that if we combine multiple post herbicide applications along with tanks mixing the residuals, it will provide the season long water hemp control. So a few locations for this study, they are located at University of Minnesota Research Center at Cosmont. And the, another one is in Franklin, Minnesota. So moving to the methodology, our design is factorial randomized complete block design. We are having four applications, two factors and 16 treatments in total. We are having four herbicide application timings and discussing what are our two factors. So our first factor is whether we have applied a pre-emergence herbicide or not. And second factor, it represents different combinations of application timings and sequence for herbicides. Since this study is about the herbicide application timing, we have a four different application timing. The pre-herbicides, they were applied immediately after planting and the early post, they were applied at a V1 crop stage and the mid post, they were applied at a V3 crop stage and the R1 and the last one, the late post, it was applied at R1 crop stage. So moving to the treatments, this table looks a bit busy, but I'll try to simplify it. Explaining once more, our first factor is whether we have applied a pre-herbicide or not. And second factor represents different combinations of application timing and sequence. Here we can see treatment one to eight in a yellow background. They have a acetochlor applied as a pre-emergence herbicide. And whereas treatment nine to 16 in a white background, they didn't have any herbicide application at planting, which means no pre-herbicide was applied. And that's only the difference between treatment one to eight and treatment nine to 16. They are similar for the post herbicide program and only differences whether we have applied pre or whether we have not. So moving to the treatment one, it was only pre-treatment. Nothing was applied at early, mid post or late post. And uh, treatment three, four and five, they had a early post application of glucosinate whereas our treatment six, seven, and eight, they didn't have any early post application. So here we are interested to see whether we can substitute early post application with the late post application. And our treatment two, it had a pre followed by only one post application of glufosinate, whereas our treatment three to treatment eight, they have a different herbicide combinations combined with and without the residual herbicide as metaglor. So what we are recording, uh, how we are investigating. So we are recording visually estimated percent water hemp control, water hemp density, crop yield, crop height, and crop injury after each of these herbicide applications. And late in the season, we are recording water hemp biomass production. And at the last, we are recording crop yield. So moving to the preliminary results from Rosemont. So at a Rosemont application of three herbicides, they reduced water hemp density at 21 days after pre, as we can see in a graph at the bottom, the application of pre herbicides it reduced pre herbicide, it reduced water hemp density to less than three plants per meter square. Whereas the non treated one, it had more than 230 plants per meter square. And these density measurements, they were conducted at 20, 21 days after pre emergence herbicide application. 
So now moving to percent water hemp control at 28 days after late post, late, late post application. So here in a yellow background, we have a treatment 128. Pre-emergence herbicide was applied for these treatments. We can see that the water hemp control has a less variability than the treatment 10 to 16 in a white background that didn't have any pre-emergence herbicide applied. So beginning with the treatment one, it was a pre-only, nothing applied as a post. It provided near about 90% water hemp control. And for the treatment two to treatment eight, they contained a pre followed by at least one post application at any time. And they provided more than 95% water hemp control. And moving to the treatment 10, it didn't had any, any pre-emergence herbicide. It had glufosinate applied only once. So we can see if we apply glufosinate only once, it didn't provide a sufficient water hemp control. And a treatment 11 had a two post application of glufosinate. We can still see the water hemp control with the both of these treatments was still lower than our treatment that contained a pre only. So this is how our treatments looked like at 28 days after late post. We can see our non-treated control. It had too many weeds. Even it's difficult to identify the crop rows. And us in the second images, images shows the glufosinate followed by a glufosinate. We can see it provided some water hemp control, but it was still not optimum. And the two images at the base, they represent the treatments that have a pre followed by multiple post. We can see that they provided an excellent water hemp control. Now moving to the soybean yield. We can see a treatment one to eight within a yellow background. They have a pre-emergence herbicide applied. They provided a better control. They provided a better yield than our treatments nine to 16 in white background. They didn't have any pre-emergence herbicide applied. If within a pre-emergence, within a pre-treatments, we see treatments that had an early post application they yielded higher than the treatments without early post, although the results were not statistically significant between all of them. And we also observe the same trend with the treatments that didn't had any pre-application. A treatment nine was our non-treated control and a treatment 10, it, were, it was applied with only one post application of glufosinate. We can see that the application, single post application of glufosinate, it didn't contributed anything to the yield. So as to sum up our preliminary results from 2020, from preliminary results from a Rosemont site, application of pre-emergence herbicide, it reduced the water hemp density and the treatments that had a pre followed by a post at any of the application timing, it provided more than 95% water hemp control. And the treatments that had a pre followed by a post application, they yielded higher than the corresponding treatments that, that were post only. And we have also observed that the post only applications of glufosinate, they didn't provide a sufficient water hemp control, neither a sufficient crop yield. Now moving to objective B. So our aim here is to evaluate the multi-tactic management options for water hemp control in soybean sugar wheat rotation. So moving to the rationale for this study, the farmers that are following soybean followed by sugar wheat rotation, they have a very reduced herbicide choice. And one of the reason is the herbicide resistance. And another reason is that the soy that the sugar beet is quite susceptible to the herbicide carryover injury. So the herbicides that are that were applied to the soybean, they could carry over next season to the sugar beet. And the two pictures at the base represents 
how herbicide carry over injury to sugar beet looks like. So our study will help the farmers to diversify their water help management options in soybean and supplement the weed management options in soybean sugar beet rotation. So our hypo hypothesis for this study is that the narrow row spacing combined with a high herbicide input will provide sufficient water hemp control and will reduce the water hemp seed bank in soil. So the field locations for the study, they are located in Franklin, Minnesota, and another one is located in Moorhead, Minnesota. So moving forward with the methodology we are adopting for the study. So a design for the study is a split plot design with the four applications. We have a 14 treatments in total and our crop rotation will be soybean followed by sugar beet. And our main plot factor is soybean row spacing and our subplot factor is the weed control program that is locked. And we have a three different herbicide application timings for the study. The free one applied at planting, the early post, they were applied at a V2 crop stage and the late post, they were applied at a V5 crop stage. And in addition for the one of the treatment, we are also simulating the harvest with seed control, which means we will remove the, all the seed heads for female plants in this treatment at the time of crop maturity. We are doing so because it's a bit difficult to use harvest weed seed control plots in small research treatment. So moving to the treatments, our main plot factor represents the row spacing. It would be either a wide row spacing at 22 inches or a narrow row spacing at a 15 inches. And our subplot factor includes, an, includes a weed control program. So our first treatment, is a non-treated control. We are not opting any of the management tactics. And the second is a weed-free control that we maintained weed-free through sequential application of glyphosate and followed by the hand weeding when needed. Our third and fourth, they represent the low herbicide input treatments and treatment five and six, they represent high herbicide input treatments and our treatment seven, it has a high herbicide input similar to the treatment six. And in this treatment, we also simulated harvest weed seed control. So this is our integrated weed management treatment. So now moving to the observation, the most of observations we are recording for this study, they are similar to objective two. We are recording visually estimated percent water hemp control, water hemp density, crop height and crop injury after each of the applications. We, similarly, we are recording water hemp biomass production. And for this study, we are also interested to see, does the treatments have any impact on water hemp seed production per plant? And at the last, we'll be harvesting to record the crop yield. And as I've explained before, the next year, it will be sugar beet crop. And we are interested to see whether this year treatment had any impact on water hemp density in subsequent year. So we will record water hemp density and crop injury in the next year, next year sugar beet crop. And for this study, we are also interested to see, is there any canopy cover difference, canopy, canopy closure difference in a narrow row versus wide row soybean over the time. So we are collecting ground-based RGB images and then we'll be processing those for percent canopy cover using a canopy application. So the canopy application works on the principle of fractional green canopy cover analysis. So, but it basically does, it, it provides the value of percent canopy cover based on the proportion of the pixels in the picture that were green. So in this study, we are also interested to see is there any change in a soil seed bank in response to the treatments? So we are collecting two soil samples per plot before crop planting in a spring, and we'll be separating seeds from the soil by using wet sieving, and then we'll follow with the water hemp seed count 
and viability assessment. And I'm sorry to say that we were not able to analyze any data for this study since we have harvested just a month back. What I have these pictures, these, pic these two pictures, they are from a treatment that have a similar weed control program except for the row spacing. The left one is from the narrow row spacing and the right one is from the wide row spacing. We can see there is a canopy cover difference between the both. And now moving to the future directions. So although we are evaluating the integration of row spacing and harvest weed seed control, there are some other weed management techniques involving cover crops or the site specific weed control like flame weed control, et cetera. So there needs to be a study on integrating those tactics. And similarly, there are some alternative harvest weed seed control technologies also like chaff lining that, so there should be studies to investigate those for seed bank management. And since we are evaluating the treatment effect only for a one year, there is a need to evaluate the population dynamics of water hemp over a long duration in soybean sugar weight rotation. So with this, I like to acknowledge and say thanks to my committee members, Dr. Devlin Sarangi, who is also my major advisor, Dr. Seth Nave, Dr. Tom Peters. And at the base, we have a picture of University of Minnesota Weeds Lab, our undergrads, Ian and Jamie, our lab technician, Ryan Mans, and the PhD student, Eric. I will also like to say thanks to University of Minnesota Extension, Deb Nikolai, and Ryan Miller. With this, I'd like to say Alexa from NDSU Weeds Lab, who helped me with my Moorhead project, and our farm collaborator, Joe Sullivan. And the studies are funded by Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council. And thank you. And now I would like to move to the questions. It doesn't say anything. <laughs> All right, so we're start opening up with some questions here. And I guess we'll start first with a question from the chat. I was Sean Meng who asked, um, how can you ensure that the water hemp uh, doesn't become resistant to the herbicides applied at pre and post treatment? So there is a question that how we can make sure that water hemp doesn't evolve herbicide resistance. Is that the same? I'm on the same line. So for this, it's, it's recommended to diversify the herbicide use. We need to use, we need to integrate the different herbicide sites of action, either as a tank mixing or either as a sequential application. And similarly, there are some alternate technologies like harvest weed seed control. We also need to use those to, to slow down the evolution of herbicide resistant water ramp populations. 
I hope this ans this answers the question. Um, so there's not any more questions in the chat. Are there any more any questions within the room? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there is a question like which sites of action they are contributing to the most carryover and are there any sites of action that doesn't carry over for us so long. So for this, there is a as I've explained, there is a herbicide site of action called ALS inhibitor. And those herb that herbicide site of action has a further categories, including sulfonyl ureas and some other. Those herbicides, they carry over the most and they are strictly permitted not to be used if, if your soybean is to be followed by sugar beet. And similarly, there are some herbicides in the another site of action, they call it PPO inhibitor. So I'll not say that all of them are safe, but there are the number of herbicides in that site of action that are recommended to be sprayed. Hope this answers the question. There was a question like the I lied back. Um, so when you collected this you know specific site, did you know if any of these things had um herbicide resistance? I'll say like they were they were collected randomly. What like there is a non-controllable factor, like most of the farmers, they will spray. And it's likely that something that we have collected, it may be resistance, resistant because that the farmer, he may have sprayed something. So there is a chance that there may be some sort of viability, but to maintain our randomness, we usually collected the samples that look like they are either escapes due to lack of coverage. We also covered those like the samples, water hemp plants that may look in a linear row. So they may be like due to the lack of coverage. So we didn't omitted those samples. Like we didn't show any preference to the, to the samples that look highly like that had a high chances of being resistant. So for thing like for this year, we were ex expecting like the treatments that had a application of residual, they will, they will have a higher control, but this year due to drought late in the season, nothing emerged like the both of them with and without residual, they were quite similar. Oh, yeah. It was, it was no 30 feet into 10 feet. Like, are you referring to a harvest weed seed control or some so like for the harvest weed seed control? I'll say it can't be used alone, like without herbicide, because it it aims to prevent aims to prevent the weed seed entry into soil seed bank. So it aims to reduce the water hemp plants that are germinating. It can't be the only control measure and it's cost. It depends on the techniques. Like there are some techniques that will just put that crop chaff into a single row. So we could either burn or we could use some natural predators. And alternatively, as I've talked, the techniques like impact mill, 
they are highly effective they include a combined modification and they definitely involve the cost like there is there is the those equipments they are they are costly and there is a another factor that there is a fuel cost associated like for driving those equipments it will be power required and then there will be the fuel cost but for saying i think it's valuable to use them like i don't exactly know any fact like if we substitute this herbicide like the last herbicide application with the harvest use weed control what will be the economics i'm sorry to say that i don't have any figure on the top of my head so we have another question in the chat from roger becker what was the status of water hemp before roundup ready soybean is it is it it is is it native and has it been around a long time? Uh, water hemp is a native and there is a study from Iowa that suggested that water hemp was a not as much severe in the 490s. They have mentioned, I think, Weed Science Society of America abstracts. They have mentioned like none of the abstract before 1990s even mentioned a water hemp. It gained prominence after it evolved resistance and with the introduction of the Roundup Ready crops and with the adoption of no-till control since it has a small wheat, small seed size. Sorry, I can't understand your question. The, but the objective of that seed count is like we are we want to see like how much is a seed deposit or how much is the seed content in the soil with the treatments, including the treatments that have a low herbicide input, including the treatments that have a high herbicide input and including the treatment that has a harvest weed seed control. So we want to know, is there any change in the soil seed bank? Like the soil seed bank, it reflects the, reflects the water hemp density in a subsequent years. So we want to see like, does a treatment involving harvest weed seed control, it removed water hemp's, water hemp seed content in the soil. So I, I hope this answers the question. So the, so the question was like why we are observing why we are counting water hemp seeds from the soil so as i have explained we are counting water hemp seeds because we want to see is there any treatment effect on a seed count in the soil because this seed count in the soil reflects the what will be the water hemp density in subsequent crop Okay. As I've explained before, so, so what are the management tactics that the farmers can adopt to slow down or reduce the resistance evolution to specific sites of action? And as I've explained before, the foremost thing that we can do is to reduce the dependency on herbicides. So if we will reduce the dependency, it will follow some other management tactics. It will help to slow down. And for the herbicides, we need to use the multiple sites of action, either by mixing, up, mixing them together or either in a sequence so that the plants that survive one site of action, they may be killed by the another one. So I think that will be the strategy to slow down.
Well, it is currently 4.30. If there are not any more uh, last minute burning questions, um, I guess we can then move on. There is one last question from Ryan Miller. Did you find any two-way resistant populations that were EPS, PS, and PPO resistant? So is a question, did we found any population that were two-way resistant to EPS, to the EPS-PS inhibitor and PPO inhibitor? Here, yeah, I'll say we didn't found any population that was specifically resistant to these two, but we have found up two populations that were three-way resistant, and it includes both EPS-PS and PPO and it involves the additional ALS inhibitor resistance. All right, well, thank you for your questions and uh, listening to Not Just Talk. And we'll see you next Monday for our next APS seminar.